For the past two years, the Canadian government, paired with the country's most powerful corporate and financial decision makers, have been executing a cover-up that tends to mask some of the biggest issues that Canadians are facing today. But now things have changed, and more and more Canadians, alongside citizens of other countries around the world, have realized exactly how they've been hoodwinked and how it has dramatically impacted their lives, be it through their finances, their work prospects, or even just their general quality of life. Now, over the past two years, you might have seen headlines or heard politicians saying that Canada was actually in the best position of any developed country in the world due to its growing economy and its comparatively lower levels of inflation. Now, here's a clip of Canada's Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, saying just that. Yes, things are hard right now, but Canada is better positioned than any country in the world. We have the strongest economic growth and the lowest deficit in the G7. But now, r reports are coming in that outline how these claims have largely been uh, a cover-up, using exploitative and some would say inhumane practices to mask an absolutely awful situation. Take a look at this. One of Canada's biggest banks is reporting that despite headline numbers looking good to the casual observer, the reality for Canadian citizens is that we're sort of already in a type of secret, hidden recession. Let me show you. They talk about how, yes, the GDP or the sort of total number for the economy has gone up. It's been growing over the past couple of years. But they also talk about how when you compare this to GDP per person, which is a sort of representation of how the economy is actually feeling, how it's working for the average citizen, well, things are a lot more different. We've seen uh, GDP per capita declines as of late uh, to the same uh, sort of levels, uh, this decline of rate, as all the previous recessions uh, going back to the 1970s were this sort of dark blue line here. And there are also comparables when it comes to the unemployment rate, um, or at the very least, the spike in unemployment, the, the change in employment numbers over time. Um, what we're seeing right now from trough to peak um, has never really happened apart from the formal recessions that we've declared over the past uh, 70 years or so. The tricky thing about this is that while average Canadians are struggling, our political and financial elite are able to point at these sort of numerical economic successes in order to cover up this struggle and to gaslight Canadians while ignoring the fact that numerical economic successes don't actually translate to the experiences of average people. You see, there have been some absolutely shocking policy changes that have happened over the past two years, and now the government is scrambling to redo and to reframe these choices that they've made, especially now that people are starting to realize exactly how these policies, which at the time might have seemed inconsequential, exactly how these policies are dramatically impacting our day-to-day -day lives. So let's get into what the changes have been, um, the new changes that are happening today, and how they impact you directly. But before we do, I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video, and that's Moomoo. With Canadian economic growth so reliant on government spending, and with the Bank of Canada cutting rates and reducing what you can make in a high-interest savings account, I am personally, and I know a lot of people who are moving any cash that they may have uh, had sitting on the sidelines, into the markets. And it's best to do that inside of a TFSA, a tax-free savings account, where your investments are protected from government taxation, and one of the best places to open up a TFSA is with Moomoo. Now, a lot of people get this wrong. A lot of people think that you can only have one tax-free savings account, but that's simply not true. TFSAs have contribution limits, but as long as you don't go over those limits in total between all of your TFSA accounts, uh, you can have as many TFSAs as you want, so you can take advantage of the unique benefits and the bonuses that different platforms have to offer for you. For example, Moomoo has lower commission fees than a lot of the big banks, as low as $1.99, so you can spend less on fees and keep more of your returns. And plus, the informational tools that Moomoo provides are, in my personal opinion, second to none. They've got all the info that you need to make the best decisions for you, and they're also offering some limited time bonuses that will give you and your TFSA a head start. Use the link in the description and you can receive a $2,000 commission rebate card that you can use over the next 90 days. Now that essentially means that you're not going to have to pay any commission fees as you get your portfolio all set up. Now you can also get a $200 stock cash coupon and up to $2,300 when you transfer funds into your new account. And you know how it goes when you support the sponsors of these videos. It helps out the channel and helps me directly. So if you like these videos and if you're interested in seeing what different investing platforms have 
have to offer, make sure to give Moomoo a try and do so using the link in the description. So a number of policies have been altered over the past two years that have been used to cover up what's really happening in Canada. But I also don't believe that every single individual who's been involved in enacting these policies is aware of what's happening. Because conveniently, when we take a look at our economy as a whole, when we look at these big GDP numbers and our growth numbers, uh, and when we apply economic theories to a country's economy as a whole, well, then it's easy to feel like what you're doing as a government official or as an economist or someone in charge of uh, uh, central banks, it's easy to feel like what you're doing is actually working. However, this quickly loses sight of what the economy is made up of individual people and how the economy is serving them. Um, these people are often forgotten amidst all of these high-level calculations. Let me explain exactly what I'm getting at here. For a long time, I've argued that the decision makers, both politically and financially, have a really hard time of getting in touch with the realities of average Canadians. They, they just don't know what it's like. And so in an attempt to make decisions, they'll often look at overall data in order to make the best decisions in their mind in order to steer the economy. Now, one example that comes to mind right now is the wage growth to productivity issue that's currently being outlined by the Bank of Canada as we speak. Um, it's a reason that they're saying uh, the growing average wages in Canada are actually an issue. Now, it sounds complex, but it really is quite simple. Uh, listen to this clip from Tiff Macklem of the Bank of Canada, uh, followed by his deputy governor, that's Carolyn Rogers. Um, they said this just last week. They're talking about how the Bank of Canada cut interest rates by a quarter of a percent, saying that now the economy risks entering a deflationary state, uh, but they're still keeping an eye on wage growth. This has a big impact on uh, why you may not feel like you're, uh, you've are you been able to keep up with the cost of living in Canada. I'll explain in a second, but listen to this. You know, there's always some uncertainty about how much slack there is in the economy. You know, we have to guard uh, increasingly against the risk that the economy is too weak. Inflation goes below our target. Uh, we do want to see growth pick up so that uh, when we get to 2% inflation, inflation uh, stays close to the target. We've got a close eye on the relationship between productivity and wages. Um, wages are still running ahead of productivity. We don't see a lot of evidence that that's feeding directly through to inflation pressure right now, but, but it's something we, we need to keep an eye on. So. Right now, the Bank of Canada is really walking a tightrope between too much and too little inflation. They rapidly raised rates to try to make Canadians feel poorer and to spend less money in order to reduce inflation from the peaks that we saw back in 2022. Um, less people spending less money in the economy means that prices tend to sort of slow down their growth. That's what they're going for. But all the while, over the past two years, the Bank of Canada has talked about how wage growth is an issue. This is what Carolyn Rogers is pointing out at the end of the clip we just watched. Their main thesis is that Canadians earning more on average is actually a bad thing when it comes to reducing inflation unless those wage increases, those people getting paid more, is also paired with those people being more productive, a proportional growth in productivity to match any wage gains. Or in other words, Canadians shouldn't make more money unless they become more at more efficient at doing their work or are starting to produce more valuable goods than they were before. Before That's kind of the only time when they're saying wage growth is okay in the economy. Otherwise, it's inflationary. If wages grow and productivity doesn't at the same time, well, it's seen as inflationary because it risks a wage price spiral where businesses have higher wages to pay and as a result, they have uh, higher costs as a business, which are then passed on to consumers, increasing prices and as a result, increasing inflation. This is at least what the Bank of Canada thinks. Now, if your eyes glazed over over the past minute, that's okay. All you need to remember moving forward is that wages going up for Canadians is seen by politicians and financial elite as an inflationary issue. It could cause more inflation. Keeping that in mind, I have a question for you. Like, What actually makes wages go up or down over time? Like, I think the primary driver of changing wages for Canadians is the changing demand for their labor. How many businesses need them to work for them, right? If a business has a hard time finding an employee at a given pay rate, well, then they'll, of course, need to raise that pay rate to make the job more attractive, enticing more people to apply for the position. Um, this is a kind of a shortage of labor is what we started to see 
in early 2022. You might remember all of the news reports about a labor shortage in Canada. We don't have enough workers. This at least was something that was put out there, certainly by uh, businesses, right? Take a look at this report. This is a report that was put out at the end of 2021 by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, and they say that labor shortages are back, and they're back with a vengeance. Now, some of the conclusions of the report uh, were that most small businesses are impacted by these labor shortages, uh, and that while a large majority of small businesses have already responded by raising wages, uh, well, actually, uh, this uh, raising of wages isn't enough to address the uh, worker shortage problem. Instead, and keep this in mind for where we're going, uh, a few actions, such as using the temporary foreign worker program and investing in automation, present the best potential in instead of raising wages. So with this labor shortage issue at the top of mind in 2022, with the constant news reports and, and different reports like this, along with the belief that increased wages won't solve this issue and will also cause an inflationary problem for the Bank of Canada, well, many national decision makers are government and otherwise changed their policies and used what's more of a quick fix. And I personally believe that this important quick fix actually created a hell of a lot more problems than it solved. In April of 2022, the government announced something that they called the Temporary Foreign Worker Program Workforce Solutions Roadmap, uh, a big jumble of a name, but it did some pretty important things, even if not a lot of people talked about it at the time. Essentially, the government expanded the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, making it a lot better for businesses. They were looking for workers, after all. There was a labor shortage. So with these changes, employers wouldn't have to raise their wages to attract workers. Instead, they were able to exploit the labor of foreign workers, workers who in many cases were told that they could turn their temporary work permits into permanent residency. Now, as a result of their desire to become a resident of Canada, and the power imbalances between these people who were hoping to get permanent resident status and uh, their employers, well, these workers were squeezed for all they had, both in terms of labor, um, but also in many cases they were working for below legal minimum wage, while being at the same time housed in unsafe rooming houses, which were in some cases owned by the same employer that hired them and could potentially be paying them less than legal minimum wage. It's awful, and if you don't know much about this, I've made a full video on this whole thing. Uh, I'll link it up above. Right when wages were starting to go up for average Canadians because of the lack of workers or the tightness in the labor market, well, that's when all these reports started coming out saying that, well, we need to uh, add more temporary foreign workers to the mix. Um, here's the same report that we were just looking at. And it talks about the effectiveness of different solutions for businesses who are having a hard time finding workers. They said, well, increasing wages is one of the solutions here. In fact, 82% of businesses tried to do this, at least to some extent. They said that only 31% of the time did this solve the issue for the businesses. While using other solutions, such as investing in automation, uh, would provide 81% of people with a solution. And, uh, uh, important for this story, using the Temporary Foreign Workers Program while only used by 16% of businesses at the time of this uh, report, uh, it solved the issue for about 52% of the people who used this program. And stay with me here because we're going to get into how all of this impacts you directly. But first, you really do need to understand all the changes that were made that led us to where we are. Uh, essentially here, temporary foreign worker programs were used as a, as a solution for the tight labor market to stop wages from increasing because the Bank of Canada, as well as uh, uh, employers, said that this wasn't actually a good thing to have happen uh, because there wasn't productivity increasing at the same time. Uh, but now, things have really changed. Uh, we're not living in the world that we were living in in April 2022. Now, there's slack in the labor market. And there's many unemployed Canadians who are looking for work, and as a result, political tension has really bubbled up to the surface. The government has turned around now and said, these changes that they made allowing more entrance in the temporary foreign worker program, well, these temporary foreign workers, they're actually no longer needed. We're making some big changes. 
Now that people are starting to realize the consequences of those changes made in 2022, essentially all of those changes are being backed up on. Here we see the headline, Trudeau announces a reduction in temporary foreign workers and there's more immigration changes to come. This is as uh, many people in Canada have been frustrated by the results. Essentially all of the caps that were expanded in 22 uh, via that temporary foreign worker program, workforce solutions roadmap, that jargon of a name, uh, all of those changes were essentially flipped back to the way that they were. And amidst these changes as of recent, the government and financial elite aren't saying that they made a bad decision at the time when they made those changes. Instead, um, they're saying that, and actually admitting outwardly and openly and rather crudely, that these foreign workers were used merely as an economic tool. They're just pawns in a game here. Here's the immigration minister, the current immigration minister, Mark Miller, um, making a, a claim that sort of supports that. And it is followed by the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, Caroline Rogers, also kind of saying the quiet part out loud. And both of these clips are from just within the past two weeks. I'd simply say this, uh, the labor shortages that we saw even a year ago are no longer there. Uh, markets are contracting, labor markets are contracting, uh, and there's no longer the needs for the people that we were bringing in those amounts to, to be here or to, or to come to Canada. That's just reality, and I think everyone expects governments to adjust. The surge in population has had a big effect on the Canadian economy. Um, in the early rise in inflation and when we saw a lot of pressure in the in the labor market um, it it helped it took some of that pressure off the labor market it added supply um, it took some of the the sort of steam out of out of the labor market and then gradually out of inflation where we're at now is the the Canadian economy is at a point where it's having trouble absorbing the number of workers into into the job rate so you know we we haven't seen a big um, increase in unemployment, but we have seen vacancies come down and we are seeing the unemployment rate tick up a bit. So it will be important that that sort of influx of, of labor supply starts to sort of match our ability to absorb it. So there it is, all out in the open. The temporary foreign worker program was just a tool that was used to address economic needs, mostly the economic needs of politicians and corporations and financial elite. Uh, and it was used also to tamp down on an environment where the wages of average Canadians could increase. Like if you listen back to those clips again, you can rewind, but just hearing them say, um, like talking in terms of labor supply and the it's almost like the people that were used as a part of this system aren't really seen as individuals but more so as a as a type of stimulus or a lever that politicians and uh, economists can pull on to impact once again these countrywide big numbers that politicians can point to to say look how our economy is doing aren't we fantastic because as we added more Canadians to the country, we increased our countrywide GDP numbers because there were more consumers to work and more consumers to spend. Now, this allowed politicians to brag about how Canada's economy has grown faster than any of our peers, any other developed nation. All the while, adding more Canadians also took pressure off the labor market, allowing businesses to keep wages low, and alleviating any of the concerns that the central bank, the Bank of Canada, had about an inflationary wage price spiral. It worked out really well for everybody who was in control. And I don't think that they're entirely wrong. All of this is good from a macro high level perspective. When you look at all of the country and when you look at the country as nothing more than a set of numbers that you're trying to balance. But when you zoom in a little bit on the base unit of the economy, which I'd argue is actually the individual people who are contributing to it, each and every individual person, well, the performance of these high level numbers, even if they look really good, it doesn't actually correspond to positive outcomes for each individual, uh, the individuals that I think at least the economy is supposed to be serving. GDP on a per person basis or productivity has gone down, largely in parallel with the average quality of life for each Canadian citizen. Now, by focusing on these big numbers, officials who are disconnected from the day-to-day -day lives of average people, they can convince themselves that what we're doing is good, we're doing a good job, and we're serving the people that we're supposed to be serving. I think that they can genuinely convince themselves of this, but in reality, when you consider the impacts on individual people rather than all people lumped into one big box, well, I think that they've made things worse. 
The only thing that's really changed now is that people are realizing it. The government wouldn't have reversed course on their immigration policy if it weren't for a fear that not doing so would lose them votes in the next election. So they turned their backs on the foreign workers who they exploited entirely to serve their big numbers, uh, seeing them not as humans, but as pawns in a game of economic supply and demand. Um, these aren't people. These are tools that we can use to impact the big numbers of the country, the big numbers of the national economy. And now the government seems confused. They're wondering why isn't the country more productive? Why is this becoming a big issue? Something that Carolyn Rogers said is in an emergency situation. They said, break the glass. Um, this is what she said about productivity in Canada. Um, so we see this is just from August 27th, 2024, uh, from ministers Anita Anand and Dominic LeBlanc um, saying, okay, the government of Canada is trying to figure out how we can strengthen our economy and how we can increase productivity and remove regulatory barriers so businesses businesses and economies can thrive. Now, in order to figure out, well, like, why isn't the country productive? Why are our small numbers looking bad? And they're going to put together immediately a working group to examine productivity and to inform of the government's economic plan. Uh, we're going to make another committee to study the committee that made decisions to change things. In the, a bunch of little changes and a bunch of sort of lip service to trying to figure out what exactly has gone on here. Now, I'd argue that these productivity issues are, at least in part, of the government's own doing. As we were just talking about, productivity, or GDP per person, was artificially lowered as the result of increasing labor supply via the addition of new workers. Now, humor me here, I think that there's a chance that if we hadn't exploited hundreds of thousands of temporary workers, treating them inhumanely, that we may not have actually seen an unending wage price spiral like all the economists were worried about. Like Canadians will only pay so much for goods and services before they turn to alternative products and options. Perhaps, and just perhaps, businesses needing to increase wages in order to attract workers could have been a good thing, not only for those workers, but also for Canada's productivity. Uh, I wonder, like, perhaps the, the increased wages paid to Canadians would have incentivized businesses to invest in productivity increasing technologies to make each individual more valuable and more productive so that they can offer goods and services at prices Canadians can afford without needing to hire endless low-wage workers. Maybe the the uh, having to pay people more wouldn't have resulted in higher costs for consumers, but maybe it would have forced those businesses to be smarter about what they're doing with their employees. How can we make them more productive? It's kind of when you think of it like a chicken and egg situation. The Bank of Canada says that wage growth is inflationary if we don't have productivity increases, but maybe it's the wage growth and the increase of costs for businesses that would then force those very same businesses to become more productive on a per worker basis. Is this crazy talk or, or do you think I'm onto something here? Let me know where I'm going wrong in the comments. And on top of this labor market intervention being a possible reason we have a declining GDP per person, a declining quality of life and declining productivity, it's also possible that the size of government and their taxation policies that are needed to support the size of government could have an impact here. Like high taxes can limit GDP growth, both for individuals and for businesses. Like for the individual, there's less of an incentive to try to make it and try to earn more, uh, try to create a company when even each dollar is taxed at like 50% after a certain income threshold. And the same goes for big businesses and the taxes that they pay. The most profitable businesses will probably choose to set up shop in low corporate tax areas. Instead of appeasing businesses by allowing them to import cheap later labor and uh, like exploit people, maybe those businesses should be encouraged to uh, do business here and uh, to become more profitable by reducing their tax burden overall. Like, I'm just trying to figure this out, and you might be saying, oh, Russell, shouldn't big businesses pay the most? Shouldn't they pay the most in taxes to support Canadian individuals? I think, yeah, it, it, it's a balance, right? And more favorable business rules can have the impact of more higher paying jobs that would actually help Canadians. And it can also help GDP per capita by allowing businesses who are more profitable to reliably invest the dollars that they're paying in taxes instead now in research and development, uh, into new ways of doing things 
things, increasing the output per worker. Now, of course, that can go horribly wrong as well. If those businesses don't invest in the right ways and they're not regulated in the right ways, well, then maybe middle management expands and CEOs can suck out the added profit out of the corporations instead of them actually investing in productivity, increasing technologies. That all can happen. But I'd argue that even in this worst case scenario, it's probably better than what we have today, where the only people who are getting fed are the ones closest to the government's slop trough. I could go into countless examples, but we'd probably be here all day. Uh, I could talk about the middleman contracting class that has inside relationships with the government that allows them to acquire these hugely profitable contracts. We saw that a little bit through the Arrive Can scandal in a small way, but um, there's evidence showing that that's actually happening on a larger scale in a far bigger way than just a $50 million app. I could talk about the, the growth of the public sector and the massive cohort of private consulting agencies like Deloitte and McKinsey that serve that, uh, that political class. Um, and those uh, consulting agencies definitely provide questionable amounts of value for the amount of dollars that we as a people through our government spend on them. Now, don't get me wrong, I think that there's a place for taxes and certainly there's a place for regulations. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Canadians, even those who understand that a certain amount of tax is good, uh, it's important to fund projects that serve the common good, even Canadians that think like that are questioning exactly how the money that's collected from them is spent, and they aren't questioning it without reason. Even government programs that from the surface look good, uh, look like a good use of our money, well, they end up with all these different levels of corruption. Uh, we saw this story uh, reported here uh, in uh, August of 2024, just recently, right? It wasn't very loudly reported by the media, but the headline here is billions in federal contracts awarded to indigenous enterprises without verification. Um, I read the article and there's a lot in here about these kinds of uh, rent-a-feather situations where corporations will pay indigenous people to pose as the heads of the corporations for a short period of time so that they can apply and get funding through these billions of dollars of federal contracts that are awarded specifically or are meant specifically for indigenous companies. A lot of fraud going on here uh, according to this global news report. And you compare this with the recent Auditor General report of the Sustainable Development Technology Canada. I think most people would say this is probably a good thing, having the, the government investing in companies that are uh, that are investing in green technologies and, and new tech that uh, that could help Canada become a more competitive economy in, uh, in, a, in a cleaner world. A lot of people would say that's probably a good thing to invest in. But this report has made some conclusions that, okay, a lot of the companies that were awarded these grants and awarded this investment, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from the government, well, they actually didn't follow up to show how they were using the funds in a way that could create this eco-friendly technology. And many of the corporations actually didn't create that type of technology at all. Um, but because they were connected, they were able to apply for these programs and use these hundreds of millions of dollars to further their corporate interests. All of this to say, even in these programs that you might think are doing a good thing for Canada, well, there's a lot of fraud that goes into it and it makes people question, well, should we be paying this much tax if we can't really trust our government to effectively implement the policies that we want uh, implemented? All of this makes me think that we've got a system that frames itself as positive, as, as a do-gooder, right? If you're a casual observer, you might think it's important that we consider the environment and that a lot of, or some at least, tax dollars should be spent supporting industries and new technologies that could help in that area. But with that, you also need to make sure that all of these support programs have the right rules and the right oversight to make sure that these dollars get into the right hands. Uh, and in order to have all the proper checks and balances to decrease fraud, you need to hire people to process all these applications to follow up and uh, the middle management of it expands and gets bloated. Or you, you don't. You don't hire the amount of people that you'd need to actually make sure that the dollars are going to the right place, and you'd allow a centralized board of political and financial elite to make the decisions with limited oversight, and as a result, you have the funds misappropriated. This is the issue, right? It's not a question of any of these social issues being good or bad. It's a question of, okay, if we fund these types of things, are we sure that those dollars are going to go to the right place? 
Now, this is really a common thing I find myself thinking more and more these days. Like, I like a lot of the ideas behind these government policies. Uh, if you assume that they're well-meaning, well, then they're targeting important issues that I think most Canadians want to see tackled, at least to some extent. But as these ideas get executed, in reality, the desired results don't end up happening and usually end up further enriching the politically well-connected. And getting back to our main topic here, this misinvestment or this improper uh, use of funds can certainly make an impact on our GDP per capita, our productivity, how the economy is serving the individual. And it makes me wonder if it wouldn't just make more sense for businesses and individuals to be taxed less and have fewer high up centrally controlled programs requiring endless tiers of middle management in order to execute them. Like, I don't have any problem with the idea of taxes. Collect money, like, sure, collect money that we can use for the greater good of the nation and to provide a level of, of safety net so that our friends and families, maybe our neighbors, aren't left in the lurch in a worst case scenario. These are probably good things to do. But over the years, I've personally lost a lot of the faith that I once had that the government would actually be able to effectively manage these funds in the best interest of Canadians. This is where I think the debate sort of gets uh, um, off track, right? We see people saying, well, would you not support these kinds of programs that could help disenfranchised individuals? It's like, no, I support that. I want these people to be as well off as they possibly can, uh, but I'm not confident in the government's ability to execute it in a proper way where those actual uh, ends, right, would be impacted. I don't believe that they could actually execute the program in a way that would help the people they're trying to help. Again, don't get me wrong, and I'm getting a little ranty here, but I think there's an important place for regulation and taxation of business, especially when it comes to increasing competition and reducing monopolies and allowing new businesses to come up and to compete with the incumbents, um, these dinosaurs of business that have been here forever. Uh, we need government to come in here and regulate things so that, well, there's not any anti-competitive practices. Uh, and in doing so, hopefully that's going to result in better and cheaper options for the average citizen. But uh, sad to say right now, most of the regulations I see seem more like they're actually designed to protect these already successful big businesses and to reduce the possibility that they're disrupted by new and nimble and highly productive and efficient organizations that could come and eat their lunch. This becomes even more concerning when you consider the revolving door between big corporations and consulting agencies and governments of all levels in Canada. Like in the US, we at least have the transparency of big corporate donations, right? Uh, it's obviously not good that corporations can donate so heavily to political campaigns and sort of choose who's in power. That's not good, but at least it's not behind the scenes. At least it's out there in the open. In, in Canada, it's more of a, I'll scratch your back now behind the scenes and, and you'll scratch mine later once I'm out of office. And there have been studies on this in Canada specifically, talking about the seemingly endless cycle of um, uh, political elite who end up getting jobs at these consulting agencies, or people at these consulting agencies that end up being in office for a time, and then transition on to another corporation, and how board members are chosen for these companies from people who were previously in power and have political sway. It's all a little bit messed up, and not a lot of it is documented. Now, it's this kind of thing that uh, it makes me think that much of our policy is actually enacted in the interests of large multinational corporations and the financial and political elite who really stand to gain from the furthering of those interests. Like, are, 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 are our politicians actually trying to make things better for the average citizen? Or is it just entirely captured by corporations and the changes we see made by these politicians and made by central bankers? Maybe this is all actually in the interests of the people who might give them a job once they're out of office. And I'm really curious what you think about this. What have I gotten right here? What have I gotten wrong? I'm just trying to figure this out by reading different articles and trying to synthesize it all here in these videos. Uh, do you think that the government has really covered up a more poorly performing economy than the numbers have been saying? And do you think they've done so by adding a bunch of workers? And how do you feel about the way that they've kind of mistreated these temporary foreign workers who they're now saying, hey, we don't need you anymore. And now that political wills are changing, uh, you can kind of leave. Like, 
Is that right? What do you think should be done there? Uh, what do you think about this whole theory of a corporate capture of politicians? Am I barking up the wrong tree with this? Let me know down in the comments what you think. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Getting so close to 100,000 and that's what we're going to try to do before the end of the year. So if you watch these videos and you're not yet subscribed, I'd really implore you to click that button. I would greatly appreciate it. And if you want all the sources for these videos, after every video is released, I send out an email to a bunch of different subscribers that have signed up on the emailing list. You can do that in the link in the description of this video. Send out all the sources after every single video. But with all that said, thanks so much for watching, everybody. Really hope this video helped you out at least a little bit, and I'll see you next time.